Thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning, still, just about. Welcome to the Urban Studies Journal Annual Lecture. Uh, my name's Andy Cumbers. Um, I'm one of the editorial team at the, uh, at the journal. Um, so uh, um, we're very pleased to have this, our second uh, annual journal lecture here at the, at the AAG. Um, before we start, I'd like to thank the Urban Geography Speciality Group for sponsoring the session and also our, our publisher, Sage, for helping us to, uh, to organise it and uh, make the event uh, possible. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I think, uh, I think it's appropriate for me to express my sadness and also all those at the journal for the recent passing of uh, Doreen Massey. Um, Doreen was an inspiration, both as an academic um, and as a political activist, to me and generations of critical geographers. Um, she's really the example of how to do engaged scholarship as a public intellectual and to try and change the world for the better. Um, I think not only has she been a massive influence, uh, more generally across geography, but of course she, she had amazing things to say about cities and regions and she's really, she really changed the way we think about cities, which I think is, is appropriate um, given, given the lecture today. Um, so uh, I, think it's, I think I just want to, you know, from the, from the, from the Urban Studies editorial team, I think we, we really want to express our regret for, um, for uh, Doreen's passing. She will be, uh, she'll be much missed. I think within within geography and the and the broader um, broader academy, and indeed indeed um, in the UK, particularly for all her, all her important public policy work on on the left. Um, I know these sentiments will be uh, shared by our, our speaker today, and uh, it's a great pre pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jamie Peck, um, who will not need much of an in uh, introduction to most of you in this room here. Um, Jamie is the research chair in urban and uh, regional political economy at the, at the uh, University of uh, British Columbia. And um, he's obviously one of the, the leading global scholars in human geography uh, today. His influence, of course, and his recognition, of course, extend well beyond um, human geography to the, the critical social sciences and, and areas of heterodox political economy uh, as, as well, where he has he's made a, an amazing uh, contribution over the last uh, 25 years. Um, now, <laughs> or so. Um, I think what's remarkable about, about Jamie's work is, is the span of his work. Um, m many people make a career out of being special, specialists in, in a particular area and becoming the global expert, but, but, but Jamie, I think, can claim to be a global expert across a range of areas, but he, he also combines that range with real intellectual uh, depth, rigour and scholarship, um, which I, I think um, is, to, is to be marvelled at, quite frankly. Um, He's probably best known for his critical work on neoliberalism and his engagement with neoliberalism, but of course he's made seminal contributions to, to thinking it, to how we think about work, how we think about labour markets, global policy, mobilities, to name just, just a few of the kind of areas that he's, uh, he's engaged with. And of course he's been a major contributor for almost, well, getting on for three decades. I keep labouring the point here. <laughs> um, on critical debates on the city, which is why we've invited him here today to give, to give today's lecture. So I think without further ado, I'll uh, pass the floor to Jamie, and he's going to talk about the transatlantic city. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Andy, for that generous uh, introduction. Uh, I want to uh, echo those uh, sentiments as well about the passing of uh, Doreen Massey. I uh, can't think of anybody more important uh, to, uh, to the work that I uh, have been doing. And uh, I was a graduate student when Spatial Divisions of Labour came out and uh, it was like somebody uh, flicked a switch and, uh, and everything changed. Everything changed. There were different ways of working, different problems to engage with and so on. I think uh, many of us especially, but not only in the UK, uh, really recognise that massive contribution that she made, um, uh, both intellectually and to the reproduction of the field in a whole variety of ways. Um, so the paper today uh, is a, a response, and I hope a constructive one, uh, and not a defensive one, to some lines of critique that have been uh, swirling around the urban studies field uh, the last few years. Uh, one line of critique uh, comes from post-colonial 
uh, studies and, and that have questioned the implicit centrality of uh, Euro-American theories of urban form and change. Uh, that's my title, kind of plays on that. Uh, and they make the case, I think, a well-made case for a more multipolar uh, urban studies. Uh, and that, that point is well made and, and taken. But it raises the question about how we deal with how we theorize uh, cities within the Atlantic space. Uh, do we just stop doing that and uh, study the cities of the, uh, the south and the east globally? Uh, or how do we rethink uh, the analysis of uh, urbanism within the transatlantic zone? So that's one of the problematics behind the paper. The second line of critique I want to respond to is the restiveness and unease that's been occasioned by the rapid ascendancy of the concept of neoliberal urbanism and its various uh, forms. Uh, on the one hand, there's a certain post-structuralist ambivalence about the weight attached to uh, so-called driving forces, accounts of urban change, uh, accounts of transnational transformation, even the use of political economy in urban studies has been brought into question under that banner of a reaction against um, uh, neoliberal urbanism. And then there's a more diffuse set of concerns about this literature, which are, relate to the heavy-handed applications of the framework of neoliberal urbanism. Uh, which are often lowered uh, from great height onto cases uh, and suppressing uh, much that is interesting and, and different about them uh, and used in a, that rather heavy-handed uh, manner. And so I think there are good, good and relevant points to make in all of, to respond to in all of these uh, critiques and I share some of those uh, concerns. And I th but I think they also raise some challenging questions about the practice of critical urban studies. And so today I want to make my case primarily through a case, uh, as many of us do in urban studies, to reflect on the transformations of that Atlantic city, but also to reflect on the city in the Atlantic space uh, more generally. So I'm going to try to raise some, more, some broader issues around what I'll be calling conjunctural analysis in urban studies. And this is a, presented as an alternative or a parallel response, if you like, to ontologically flat conceptions of the city, which I think have propelled a lot of the discussion recently on comparative urbanism. Now, we all know that comparison's great. It's a kind of eat your greens uh, sort of advice, so methodologically, you can't be against it. It is good for us. The more of it we do, the better we'll be, and so on. I'll accept all of that. But I think a lot of the pleas for comparative urbanism have been a bit uh, empty, and they haven't produced much of a response. And I think that's largely because they've, one of the reasons for that is they've uh, been based on a notion of kind of lateral comparison, city to city, without taking account of the broader conjunctural patterns of urban change. And so they suppress uh, some of the important sources of comparative analysis in order to make the case for an ontologically flatter mode of comparison. Um, that's not my cup of tea. Uh, but I want to suggest that we can think about urban transformations conjuncturally as a complementary, alternative, parallel approach. So that's the uh, preamble. Um, this is what I want to do. I, I, I just seize the opportunity to get David Harvey, Steve Buscemi and Donald Trump uh, <laughs> on the same slide. Uh, and this is uh, Governor Chris Christie with his hostage face after he... Uh, uh, committed to uh, support the presidential campaign of Donald Trump. Uh, it gives you some sense of where I'm going with this, uh, perhaps. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about transformations in urban theory uh, more generally, and I'll be making a couple of points there. Firstly, about the potential role of conjun conjunctural uh, urbanism, uh, and then to suggest that there are ways in which we can think in that spirit about the rise of what... Um, I've been calling with work with Heather Whiteside, uh, financialized urban governance. Then I'll get on to the case study, and I could truly talk about this for hours and hours. It's a fascinating, vivid, powerful case which is unfolding literally in front of our eyes, news daily about Atlantic City's travails. Uh, but I'll, I'll make my comments there in, under three headings. Uh, alliterative, as I like to do, uh, extractive forms of urbanism, uh, the, the exhaustion of an entrepreneurial pattern of urbanism in that particular case, which I think is a, a potentially a critical case in that sense, and then the meaning of the potential imposition of a form of emergency rule 
uh, on Atlantic City uh, at the present time. So I offer these comments also as a recovering regulation theorist and a reluctant uh, financial geographer. Uh, the, reluctant, the recovering regulation theorist in me uh, retains a concern with the emergent forms of regulatory projects and the ongoing reconstruction of hegemonic forms of urban development and also with more macro conjunctures that become that may have become kind of more theoretically unfashionable uh, over the years but I uh, hold on to them as uh, partly reflecting that uh, earlier work that I did in regulation theory I still think there's important work to do at the macro level uh, that we've been neglecting recently secondly as a reluctant finance geographer I've been grappling in the last few years with the meaning of austerity as a late, as late neoliberal condition which is actively politicized, of course, and named in Europe, uh, both by the people that are pushing that project and of those that are against it. Uh, but I've also I've been in interested to explore what that means in the United States, where the word really isn't in political currency, but austerity is a sort of institutionalized, normalized system in the US system of uh, fiscal federalism. So that's an example, if you like, of taking concepts that really have salience in the European context and thinking about what they mean in a discrepant or different context. I think that's how we can work with conjunctural uh, urbanism. And in this context as well, I'm prepared to belatedly acknowledge the importance of the creative city uh, publicly, uh, although here I'm going to be thinking more of the importance of creative accounting than uh, creative lifestyles. Uh, and I think creative accounting is playing an increasingly important role in the crisis management of the American uh, city. I'll also, somewhat out of character, recognise the significance of ordinary urbanisms, uh, although I want to suggest that it's about time we considered the neoliberal city to be a pretty ordinary thing. And it's the normalisation of neoliberal rule, which might be kind of slightly boring for a fast-moving field, but I think that normalisation is actually something that we need to pay attention to, uh, rather than kind of rushing on to the next a thing. Normalization, I want to suggest, is not a static condition, it's a restive, unstable, contested condition. And I think that is uh, what the kind of hegemonic moment is in terms of neoliberal urbanism. So behind this uh, case then, or this, dis this discussion today, is a, a question about how we position cases and how we might use cases like uh, Atlantic City as a single example uh, and what we might conclude from them, how far we might draw our conclusions. And I'm going to suggest uh, that there's a new form of Caesarism being pushed in, at least in the United States and try to make some links between Caesar's Palace Casino and uh, Caesarist modes of urban governance. May not get that far but let's, uh, let's see. Okay, so the invocation of transatlantic urbanism in my uh, title is a prompt to reflect on the interpretive and political status of cases positioned in transatlantic space, both conceptually and in terms of regulatory relays and conjunctures. Uh, Atlantic City, the resort town in New Jersey, is in some respects an atypical city, but it's beset by increasingly typical problems. It's been said that Atlantic City is less of a place, quote, more of a proposition and a ploy in a recent article in the New Yorker on, on the city's travails. The city's had a good run with its casino economy, but its luck has clearly run out in the last uh, few years. And by next uh, Friday, the city of Atlantic City will be paying its workers, its municipal workers, cops, firefighters, or the city workers with IOUs because the city literally has no money to meet the payroll. So this is a particular form of urban crisis that I want to position uh, in theoretical and political terms. So the, uh, the mayor of Atlantic City, uh, Don Guardian, uh, a gay Republican mayor, interesting character, uh, extremely energetic, lots of support from, the, uh, from his local electorate, a city which where Democrats outnumber Republicans nine to one. Uh, Don Guardian was uh, elected about 18 months ago. He's regarded as a no bullshit kind of mayor that speaks uh, directly and deals, is dealing directly with the city's problems. And he says that he's learned to deal with three crises before lunch every day in his period as, uh, as the mayor of Atlantic City. And when he gave his 
2015 State of the City Address, he used a rather unfortunate tagline of at least we're not Detroit as he went through the series of travails that the city had encountered in his first year of office. Uh, four of the city's 12 casinos had closed uh, during that year, losing, costing the city 10,000 jobs. Uh, two thirds of the municipal tax base um, is reliant on, on gaming revenues and so that really basically guts the entire economic basis of the municipal budget. And so he went through listing these problems, but then saying, well, at least we're not Detroit. You know, it could be worse. Detroit was just emerging from its bankruptcy uh, at that moment. Others were pointing out uh, that Detroit uh, was not, uh, sorry, that, that this was not Detroit in the sense of uh, the organization of uh, municipal finance. Um, municipal finance experts argued that Atlantic City was in quite a different category to Detroit. There's no, bank, there's no kind of bankruptcy, use of the bankruptcy law in New Jersey. There are no emergency manager provisions uh, historically in New Jersey either. So they'd have to use different tools to respond to the Atlantic City crisis. And the, city of, the state of New Jersey had traditionally been much more paternalist in its approach to its municipalities. So this was not going to be a Detroit kind of story, the finance experts uh, told us. Uh, but this is a city that's clearly been losing at its game of monopoly uh, over the last uh, few decades. Atlantic City is the, the place that gave its street names to the original commercialized form of the monopoly game. Uh, and in many respects, the way in which these dynamics have been played out are about the uses and abuses of monopoly and uh, ending up with uh, uh, essentially a destroyed local economy. It's a city that was born of speculative intent and it's now exper experiencing its own very particular insolvency crisis. So just after Don Guardian had made his speech about not being Detroit, uh, the, uh, the governor of uh, New Jersey, Chris Christie, uh, appointed Detroit's emergency manager as a special advisor uh, to Atlantic City, uh, literally within days of that, uh, in January 2005. Uh, the municipal bond market responded to this news by slashing the bond rating six grades into deep junk territory, making it almost impossible for Atlantic City to access the bond market. So Wall Street saw a serious haircut coming with the appointment of the person that had just structurally adjusted the city of uh, Detroit. So what to make of this story then uh, in the context of um, in the context of uh, transatlantic uh, urban theory. I think we have to position this case in, in the context of the uh, variegated geography of fiscal federalism and austerity urbanism in its late kind of crisis ridden uh, forms. Um, and we can see this moment where emergency managers, managements were appointed uh, in, in, uh, in Atlantic City as one in which uh, a particular kind of crisis is, is being uh, confronted. Uh, Christie appointed not one but two emergency managers, both of them conveniently called Kevin, uh, but spelt slightly differently. The Kevin from Detroit, Kevin with a Y, Kevin Orr, uh, went to the first press conference when his role as an emergency manager in Atlantic City was announced and refused to use the word Detroit in repeated questions from the press. He, he advised the press to be very, very careful trying to analogize what's happened in any other community, including uh, that part of Michigan that you referenced where I've had some recent experience. Uh, there is not a template, he insisted. Um, so I actually agree with Kevin Orr on at least on that point. There isn't a single template for the way in which these financial crises have been managed. And this is how I actually came to this case, having been working for a few years on the Detroit crisis and then Kevin Orr's work there as the emergency manager. So in a sense, I followed him uh, to this particular case. Okay. So this is where I just reflect briefly on what this means in terms of the, uh, the universe or conjunctural universe of urban theory. Um, I want to start with David Harvey's notion of the entrepreneurial city. You know, the, if you like, the uh, original story of entrepreneurial urbanism. In his famous paper from 1989, one of his most cited of his career, David Harvey described a proto-hegemonic, checkered pattern of entrepreneurial experimentation, 
which he described as pockmarked with as many successes as failures. And he was reading that uh, conjuncture then in that paper on entrepreneurial urbanism uh, from Baltimore, but also beyond Baltimore. It was, it was a reflection on his own transatlantic movements, especially between Paris and Oxford and Baltimore. His cases were all drawn from that zone. And he was reflecting, he was conducting what I would argue was a quite exceptional form of conjunctural analysis. He was reading across his cases, theorizing through the concrete and drawing together the imminent pattern of urban transformation, uh, which I think has been extraordinarily uh, prescient. Uh, the repertoire that Harvey described at the end of the 1980s has become so customary that it's hardly worth listing now. This is Entrepreneurialism 101 in all of our lectures. Waterfront redevelopment, urban spectacles, mega events, corporate attraction, sports stadia, event architecture, cultural boosterism, creative gentrification. All of this was talked about in Harvey's paper uh, from 1989. So this is the boring stuff of everyday urban development and discourse. But its very normalization is the point that I want to underline. Uh, entrepreneurial urbanism these days is associated with a battery of competitively induced and governmentally respons responsibilized weak policy measures, tired interventions, cliched rationales, Nothing really works very well. They're very low returns interventions. There's low expectations about them. And they're sort of rhetorically inflated, uh, partly to overcome the, uh, that problem of low expectations. So we've got a pattern of urban innovation, where we have to call it in scare quotes, I suppose, uh, that's been trained on a very narrow path, the narrow path that Harvey anticipated in the late 1980s, which has yielded serial underperformance low expectations and low returns, occasional hits but many misses. So Harvey's, I want to suggest, was a de facto conjunctural analysis, not necessarily all that explicitly so. Um, he didn't explicitly work through especially the levels of state space that Neil, Neil Brenner and others would later work on. Uh, he missed some of those links, uh, but he offered us, I think, a pretty powerful conjunctural analysis. And he was describing actually a post-Keynesian pattern of restructuring uh, positioned in that kind of trans northern Atlantic uh, space. He was describing something which became normal. And I think I'll just recognize its normalization by referring to this uh, document from the OECD, their Competitive Cities Program, that summarizes where we're at at the moment like this. The reorientation of urban policy planning from public service provision to private enterprise promotion caused a profound change in a policy approach from managerialism to entrepreneurialism. Quote Professor Harvey from 1989 in an OECD document. Uh, as a speaker of the truth of uh, urban change. Uh, the adoption of such a totally different attitude has been accelerated by the growing recognition among policy planners that the only way that cities can compete in an increasingly unpredictable and globalized economy is by pursuing proactive strategies designed to secure their competitive advantage over their competitor, perceived competitors. Now, the fact that this, this comes from the OECD, I'm not suggesting this is some sort of vanguardist organization. It's actually, it's in many respects, the OECD uh, epitomizes the soft center of the urban policy consensus. It can't get too far ahead of its member states. It tends to organize the consensus and nudge the consensus, not develop really vanguard positions as the World Bank or other multilateral agencies might. And so the OECD's own position reflects itself the long transition away from the Keynesian consensus when urban policy was talked about in the context of national government responsibilities um, and the orientation was to the demand side, to interventionism, to redistribution, to a kind of soft neoliberal consensus articulated by the OECD with an emphasis on competition, local scale experiments, social partnership and so on. So the OECD, OECD doesn't impose a frame, it rather articulates more or less after the fact of policy change uh, where the consensus lies. And so I think this is a statement of the banal normalization of the phenomena that Harvey identified as more of the leading edge of change in the 1980s. It's become business as usual in a kind of ordinary way. 
Now, the language that is partly taken over from that language of the entrepreneurial city is the language of neoliberal uh, urbanism. You get a sense of its dramatic ascendancy in the uh, urban studies literature from this, uh, from this uh, chart I've produced. It's undeniably true that the use of the concept or term neoliberalism has been subject to a form of sprawl in uh, urban studies, um, only loosely correlated perhaps to its material and ideological presence. Look, this only really got going in the late 1990s, the surges being after the early 2000s, there was another peak after the two 2008 Wall Street crash. So, in a sense, the recognition of uh, uh, urban, uh, of neoliberal urbanism came rather late. It's arrived in this perhaps somewhat faddish way. Uh, you understand the reaction against it. It just kind of dramatically arrived. This chart should have started in 1973 or earlier in many respects, but it didn't. Um, so th I think this is an interesting uh, re uh, reflection. Studies. Uh, sometimes it is used as a sort of template. Sometimes it's used as an historical or zeitgeist indicator. Sometimes it's used as an explanatory shorthand. There's a lot of uh, uh, abbreviated uses of this term, uh, and it's arrived late and, and spread suddenly. So, not surprisingly, we need to reflect on its usage. So, I see neoliberalism in my recovering regulationist way as a prevailing pattern and tendential form of social regulation, which is interdigitated with an historically and geographically specific mode of development. My preference has been to refer to an ongoing and non-convergent process of neoliberalization as a rolling process of transformation, uh, now starting to stabilize, I would argue, as a hegemonic regulatory pattern. The use of the term neoliberal, I would argue, though in urban studies and anywhere else, should be an occasion for explanation, not a replacement for explanation. It isn't the all-purpose explanation for everything we see. It's a site where explanations must be constructed. And they must be constructed, I would argue, with recourse to a range of mid-level formulations and recognition of conjunctural conditions. Neoliberalism isn't we, we see a lot of use, I think, of the sort of neoliberalism did it again kind of analysis, uh, and the analysis is left at that point. How neoliberalism does it, what those actions mean for the transforming nature of neoliberalism, I think are the pertinent questions which often get neglected. Now, the research effort in what might be called regulationist urbanism uh, has been particularly concerned with frontal movements in the neoliberal project. That this work has also, I would say, paid insufficient attention to normalization, to the dynamics of normalization, the governance of normalization, everyday regulatory conditions, as opposed to their frontal emergent form, which not surprisingly many of us are, pay attention to those frontal forms, but what occurs in the wake of frontal transformation is this banal normalization which can easily become kind of taken for granted in our own analyses as well as by local actors. So if I'm to summarize uh, the critiques of critiques of neoliberal urbanism that have started to emerge, I think there's a number of uh, re recurring uh, points that are made in this literature. Um, first, the claim is that neoliberal urbanism is invoked as a Dirk ex machina in a top-down fashion without much uh, qualification. Secondly, it's argued that it could be practically indistinguishable in many analyses uh, from capitalism, globalism, the zeitgeist. It's a kind of uh, substitute term for many of those things and it's difficult to figure out the difference in some uses of it. It's argued that the emphasis on cross-case connections and continuities creates the impression of global convergence and programmatic coherence. It's argued that there are ex exaggerated roles that are attributed to ideology, to hegemony, and to the power of ideas in the, by invoking the term neoliberalism. It's argued that the analytical optic leads to an underappreciation of non-neoliberal forms, uh, the conditions of agency, as well as political alternatives and countercurrents uh, to neoliberalism. It's of argued also in this more skeptical uh, literature that ins ins insufficient attention is being paid to mid-level mechanisms and mediating conditions. 
and finally, that the historical geographies of neoliberal urbanism have been incompletely drawn and we've got very compressed and limited uh, map, if you like, of the pattern of neoliberal transformation. I think these are all useful cautions. Not a single one of them invalidates, I uh, would argue, the theoretical status of neoliberalism. There are, it's about how we use that concept. Uh, and these reactions are reactions against uh, inadequate, improper kind of use of the concept, which I think is out there. I think this is a problem and it's a challenge to how we operationalize the concept of neoliberalism. So I don't think any of these are any, in a, in a sense, disabling from a theoretical point of view, but they do refer to our methods and the use of concepts. Patrick Legales, for example, is quite correct that the term and the concept of neoliberal urbanism is often used in the absence of clear specifications of intermediating, intermediating mechanisms. And he proposes a tighter version of the concept, rather more like a policy paradigm. I agree with Patrick's critique, but I don't agree with his solution. If he wants to fix uh, neoliberalism only as a policy paradigm, what he loses is the fact at a higher level of abstraction, this works through churn and experimentation uh, to work through different policy repertoires all the time. I think fixing it at too low a level of abstraction actually loses that quality of how neoliberalization uh, works. But I think Patrick's quite right to point to the need for these mid-level connections in accounts that instead tend to skip straight up the level of abstraction to invoke a big picture neoliberalism from a local case. So, I've made the point, I think, that neoliberalism should be conceptualized at a higher level of abstraction as a hegemonic or proto-hegemonic uh, form. And how might we respond constructively and critically to position our own case studies in relation to this? Um, rather than producing a situation, which I think we see in the literature now, where papers that invoke neoliberalism are either performing a kind of weak affirmation or they're avoiding the term altogether. There's a kind of polarization in the literature, I think, around those kind of positions. And many of the articles that use the terminology provide a pretty weak affirmation that it's at work again and don't get much beyond that. Um, and so what kind of cases can we use to unsettle that pattern? I think we can use what I call the ABCs of uh, alternative uh, kind of case studies. A is for atypical cases. I think atypical cases can stress test many of those claims. B is for boundary cases, boundary cases that are located on the conjunctural edges or uh, at the edges of different systems are always revealing, I think. And I think we can use C, critical cases. Critical cases are particular forms of restructuring, but we've all, always got to figure out where those individual cases, individual city cases, are positioned on the moving landscape of transformation. I think that's the part that is often skipped over in many of our analyses that miss this intermediating uh, level. So I think that the missing intermediating concepts are one of the reasons why there's a certain kind of neoliberalism fatigue in the literature, even though I'd argue we need to hold on doggedly to it, even if it's a horrible concept that doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't work in, in some respects. And so this is why I think we need to use notions of hegemony and conjuncture much more explicitly in urban studies. Hegemony, in Raymond Williams' classic uh, definition of it, depends for its hold not on uh, not only on its expression of the interests of a ruling class, but on its acceptance as normal reality or common sense by those in practice subordinated uh, to it. I'll refer to uh, Robert Rojek's cleverer brother in this uh, uh, next uh, slide. Um, the, it, Chris Rojek's book on Stuart Hall's work talks about um, the hegemony as the governance of normalization, the management of normalization and now things become normal in common sense. Uh, they, they, Stuart Hall and Gramscian notions of hegemony argue that the hegemony frames the terrain that ideas and conflicts occupy. It doesn't prescribe the content of that, but it predisposes direction and orientation. It indexes networks of political, intellectual and moral leadership, not to say that's on, on, the only thing to pay attention to, but it asks us to find the connections to those forms in everyday expressions of hegemonic forms. 
It doesn't suppress, but I would argue positions difference, such that some positions are accentuated while others are rendered subordinate or marginal. I think this is how hegemony actually works. And it's never, Stuart Hall points out, a completed project. Hegemony is a process, not a state of being. It's always in the making, always subject to the ongoing work of consolidation, always uh, contested. So hegemony then is never static or flat. It's not the opposite of diversity. It's not the opposite of change. Working with hegemony needn't be a matter of some once and for all recognition of capital H historical formation uh, and then sub sub subordinating everything else to that. It can and should be about tracing the shifting forms of consolidation and contestation, identifying conjunctural patterns and their dynamics of reproduction. So it's not about slotting cases into some prefixed classificatory system or subjecting them to blunt categories of analysis, but should be about, I would argue, using cases to stress test, refine, reject, transform our own uh, mid-level uh, concepts. So how might we start to approach cases like uh, my case of uh, Atlantic City in the spaces of conjunctural uh, urban uh, formations? Uh, what kinds of emergent hegemonic forms of neoliberalism can we identify? and Where does it fit in these lower levels uh, of abstraction? One place to position Atlantic City, which is going through this form of uh, emergency managed fiscal adjustment at the moment, is in a broader pattern of financialized adjustment. In that sense, it lives in the same world as Detroit, it arguably lives in the same world as Athens and Mexico City, all of which are have been going through for many years now forms of finance-led adjustment. And there are intermediate forms of those, of those programs in each of those places. In Europe, we have the austerity uh, programming. In the Global South, there's been the history of structural adjustment, of course. Um, in the United States, there's use of the bankruptcy code, the Chapter 9 provisions of the bankruptcy code, uh, to manage uh, the crises of cities like Atlantic City, Detroit, uh, and, and elsewhere. They, of course, are two cities located in the US space, and it's the uses of the bankruptcy code reflects the particular possibilities of intervening with uh, the US machinery of, uh, of legal intervention and, and bankruptcy courts and so on. And so here there are different modulations of financialized urban adjustment in each of these and many other cases, of course, that we could position. And this isn't the only thing that's going on in North American urbanism, of course, there are other, other processes at work. There's the Richard Florida-inspired uh, projects of creative urbanism, which are all over the place. It's just about as banal as you could uh, hope for, I think, these days. Uh, there are, there's the Edward Glazer version of the neo-competitive city, uh, which is being promoted at the, more recently, a kind of more uh, austere uh, alternative to the uh, Richard Florida story. And there are various kinds of sources of policy advice uh, that emanate from those. Uh, the Edward Glazer advice to cities in the United States is to go back to basic, basics, police, charter schools, and that kind of thing, not to fund much beyond that. He has a similar version of that for cities outside of North America, where they just get the basics, only minimal policing and basic social control, uh, and encouragement of a, a kind of auto liberal. Uh, urban settlement. Um, in the creative urbanism space, we've, there's the rise of uh, cultural quarters and sort of hipster models of IT and so on, uh, close to the center of that project. And Detroit is arguably one place where all of those projects intervene simultaneously. I think Detroit is in a special position with respect to a series of conjunctural projects of urban transformation at the moment. It's been financially adjusted. It's seeing the application of kind of startup city arguments associated with Ed Glazer. Uh, the hipsters are uh, moving in, of course, to save the city, uh, traveling there from Brooklyn and other places uh, well, where they operate on a sort of new frontier of, uh, of urban uh, intervention. 
So my point here is there are some family resemblances between that space of financialized adjustment. We, obviously, we need to recognize the differences that exist between structural adjustment, the bankrupt uses of the bankruptcy code, the European austerity project, and so on. These are not the same thing, but I think they partake of many of the same rationalities. We shouldn't abandon our broader concepts because we need to refine them for use at different levels of analysis. So I think this is just a thought experiment about how we might start to fill out some of these intermediate spaces. This is obviously a very crude way of, of doing that, but I'll suggest that we can do it also uh, with notions of the way in which financialization has been sort of intervening and starting to transform the model that Harvey described uh, effectively a generation ago. And again, this is the work that I've been doing with Heather Whiteside to try to figure out what financialized urban governance means. What does it mean to financialize the growth machine? I think it means a number of things. It means a new kind of mun municipal Calvinism uh, is abroad. A pious and unforgiving doctrine that cities get what they deserve in a context increasingly decoupled from Keynesian transfers and redistributions where cities in the US face heightened dependence on the local tax base and therefore on local economic uh, conditions. It means an operational matrix defined by normalized budgetary restraint and austerity, exacerbated by cyclical exposure, unfunded mandates, responsabilization of the local state, fiscal gating of suburbs and many other uh, developments. Thirdly, it means the imposition of bondholder value disciplines as existential conditions for urban management. Again, I'm speaking about the North American uh, conjuncture of this at the moment. Reflecting increased uh, dependence on the municipal credit market, uh, the gatekeeping, policing and surveillance functions of credit rating agencies assume far greater importance in this context. And rather than growth machines, we look at now some of these cities as debt machines. And debt machine forms of governance tend to favor, favor lean administration, rolling privatization and monetization of assets, um, rollbacks in public sector, employment norms, contracts and standards, rolling deunionization of the last bastion of the US union movement, which is the public sector. 50% of American union members are in the public sector now, and they are right in the front line uh, in terms of the latest waves of deunionization uh, efforts. Fifthly, uh, there's a form of fiscal uh, Caesarism at work here, the empowerment of technocratic carders, including emergency managers, bankruptcy specialists, turnaround uh, specialists and so on, who work, many of whom are working under court supervision and imposing strict plans of adjustment on cities like Detroit and now Atlantic City, and frequently involve the suspension or circumvention of local democratic channels. Good Lord. And finally, deepening, fin deepening financialization as a late entrepreneurial condition. Uh, I want to suggest that we can think of financialization as the sort of autumn of the entrepreneurial city, uh, the late phase uh, degradation of that uh, model. Uh, and financial, the financialization of the growth machine is turning it into debt machines. So let me now give you a quick uh, run through what is happening in Atlantic City, this amazingly vivid uh, place. I'm not suggesting that Atlantic City is a paradigm. There is no such thing as a paradigm in a conjunctural analysis. But I think there are cases that shed different kinds of light on the moving terrain of urban transformation. Atlantic City is a city with a knack of promoting itself beyond its true worth, according to uh, Boardwalk Empire, the, uh, the book that inspired the TV show. Uh, it's a beach resort that enjoyed explosive growth in the early 20th century. Uh, there were 99 trains a day going to Atlantic City by the mid-1920s. Uh, by that time, it was also the blackest city in the north, uh, having been the destination for working-class African-American migration since the time of emancipation. And it was a city that produces a lot of working class uh, jobs that were filled by African-American workers from the late 19th century. It's a place that's 
had basically 90 odd years of unbroken Republican machine politics. It was an open town at the early 20th century, flaunting state laws on alcohol consumption, gambling joints and prostitution. And of course it was a notorious wet city during the Prohibition era uh, that uh, described in the Boardwalk Empire TV show. The post-war decline of Atlantic City was precipitous. It was caused by changing vacation patterns and cheap travel. Uh, really meant it, that its future as a resort city was, uh, was over. Um, it was described as a plantation by the sea by some, slipping into long-run decline and racialized poverty and exclusion. By 1964, Frank Sinatra played his last show at the famous 500 Club, and that was also the year 1964 when the National Democratic Convention uh, was, took place in Atlantic City and famously backfired as the media spotlight was trained on this shabby resort town uh, that, far from an opportunity to promote itself, really was revealed in the terrible state that it was in. So the, what's been called the Atlantic City Gamble then, to turn to casino gambling as the solution to these problems of long-term decline, reflected a particular uh, conjunctural moment in, in, in the broader process of transformation. Uh, the Atlantic City camp Gamble that the benefits would flow to the disabled and seniors across the state. Uh, the referendum that passed on, on gambling in 1976 was heavily bankrolled by Resorts International, an offshore casino conglomerate uh, that would open the first casinos in Atlantic City. Uh, Resorts International secured super profits by occupying this monopoly position. Its share price leapt from $2 to $210 on the day they opened the first Atlantic City uh, casino. The duopoly that Atlantic City occupied, with only Las Vegas as the other uh, casino town in the United States, meant it, it, a quarter of the US population was in a daily commute of Atlantic City, and it used that access to build a re regional uh, casino uh, market. So this was the city then being used as a tool for extractive uh, capitalism, as a profile in the 1980s had it. Uh, in Las Vegas they built a city to support casinos, in Atlantic City they did it the other way around. They built the casinos to support a flagging city. But they used this economic development uh, strategy of the casinos, uh, turned out to backfire extremely badly because casinos don't let the money trickle out of course, they are designed to capture uh, money not to let it pass into the local community. Uh, a lot of money that flowed into Atlantic City, Nick Baumgarten says, flowed right back out again. It was boxed off from the city. The casinos are designed to keep patrons inside losing money rather than outside spending it. So this kind of casino development model then effectively contained the economic development benefits such that they were uh, of a casino legalization. All right. So during the 1980s, uh, the casinos, the monopoly that was created in Atlantic City kind of worked in the short term. Its visitor numbers jumped from 7 million a year in the 70s to 35 million a year by the late 1980s. At the, late, at the end of the 80s, real estate prices in Atlantic City were comparable with downtown Manhattan. Uh, and 40,000 jobs have been created. So a, a growth machine, if you like, was created. Uh, but it was blighting local businesses. Uh, not many businesses could survive around the casinos or a local restaurant couldn't survive, for example. The local businesses you find near casinos are pawn shops, uh, check cashing operations, payday lenders and so on. It doesn't actually, the benefits do not reach out to the local community. So this was a particularly perverse form of urban growth based on the sort of zero-sum logic that Harvey had anticipated, uh, tendencies towards over-accumulation and overbuilding of the same urban forms, and strongly negative uh, externalities. So 
So what the Federal Reserve of, of Philadelphia called the Atlantic City Paradox then was this kind of growth amongst misery. The casinos as these temples of, uh, of, uh, of accumulation surrounded by a desert of uh, underdevelopment and, and racialized unemployment and poverty. According to a late 80s uh, account in the New York Times, the contrast in Atlantic City between the casinos and the surrounding area is so severe as to invoke the image of a colonial capital, where imperialists from across the sea recreated a foreign architecture and culture amid an indigenous poverty and dependency. Beyond this conflict of cultures, however, is a failure of local government, both local and state. What the casinos were effectively doing was cannibalizing uh, Atlantic City having arrived there, while the regional gam gambling market is, itself was quickly becoming saturated as other states and cities joined uh, the growth model. Now here is Donald Trump uh, congratulating himself on how well he did and during his time in Atlantic City. Uh, the casinos have always been a great deal for me, he said. How, how much have I made off the casinos? Off the record, a lot, he said, on the record. Uh, I put a lot of debt on them, I took a lot of money out, and I bought a lot of real estate in New York. So I'm very happy with the way things worked out. So this kind of extractive model is epitomized by Trump's uh, own approach to management and perhaps presidential uh, governance, we shall see. Uh, Trump had been monitoring Atlantic City since the late 1970s when he described the place as a ghost town and he turned a fortune through its three casinos, but eventually himself came unstuck in the junk bond market, having borrowed too heavily, so he had to exit in a rather disorganized manner in the end. So what we have here is a story of the eventual saturation of a, a casino, regional casino market. While Atlantic City was once an, once an island of casinos, there's now so much built out competitive environment in this, that this is a supply driven industry, according to a Wall Street analyst uh, uh, recently. So Carl Icahn is the current successor to Donald Trump in Atlantic City as the major player in the town. He is currently leading the fight against the unions in the casinos uh, to deunionize uh, the town, to gut uh, the costs out of the casino business himself. This gives you a sense of the way in which the casino uh, legalization of casinos has sprawled across the states uh, since uh, New Jersey made the first move in the mid-1970s. This has become a kind of normalized pattern since and the regional markets have been destroyed as a result. So this is the backdrop then to Atlantic City slide recently into emergency rule and insolvency. This was driven ultimately by a one-two punch. Uh, the first punch was the legalization of gambling in other competing local markets, especially in, in uh, Pennsylvania, which opened its casinos in the 2006. And this arc, I think you could say, is a sort of uh, arc of uh, the rise and fall of a particular kind of growth model and its complete exhaustion uh, by the time that regional competition occurred. And then of course we had the Wall Street crash and uh, the various consequences of that. The result of all of this is that revenues in the casino, the one, this is a single industry town and this is the industry, um, uh, the revenues in the casino have dro dropped by half since 2006, uh, maybe just about starting to plateau. So I'm galloping towards the conclusion now, as you can probably tell. Um, so how did uh, the local uh, managers of this city respond to this uh, situation? Initially, Chris Christie as governor uh, and the, uh, the local administration responded by applying the conventional uh, remedies. Um, they, uh, Chris Christie was elected in 2010. He pledged to save Atlantic City, but was worried that it may be dying. And so he tried to bring it back to life with a $30 million do AC marketing campaign, $12 million spent on an art park, but also placing the city under financial uh, supervision. Chris Christie famously bailed out the $2.4 billion Revel uh, Casino, uh, which opened in 2012. Um, he put a quarter of a billion dollars of state funding into this project to make sure that it actually made it to opening day. It opened in spring 2012, went bankrupt twice, and then closed within uh, just over a year. 
Uh, it was later sold off for $82 million for cents on the dollar. $2.4 billion building uh, was just bought for $82 billion and it's now owned by an eccentric millionaire who's got notions that he might turn it into a, a water park, a tower of geniuses think tank, uh, a, hold, a high rise holding tank for Syrian refugees, a polo field where he keep the horses in the car park. I mean, this is an absolutely absurd pattern of development. This has all happened after 2010. So the closure of the revel uh, is really a, epitomizes, I think, the current challenges. So emergency management then has become the new normal uh, in Atlantic City. Uh, the emergency managers appointed in early 2015. Their first report suggested that all needed to make a shared sacrifice and that the city simply can't stand on its own, they recognised. So they recognised that there was no way that the city could cut itself to recovery on this, uh, from the position that it had been re uh, left in by that point. And so this is the context for the latest rounds of state takeover proposals uh, which have been circulated since January of 2016 and are still being discussed in the New Jersey uh, legislature. The proposal to take over Atlantic City, according to Mayor Guardian, a uh, Republican mayor, I'll remind you, was described as a Pearl Harbor moment and at the acts of a fascist dictatorship, Governor Christie is referring to. Atlantic City Council member Ernest Corsi described it as a hostile takeover by uh, Trenton, New Jersey, uh, reflecting a plantation uh, mentality for this city that is a uh, majority minority city uh, being taken over by uh, uh, the state of New Jersey. Chris Christie, for his part, after his failed presidential campaign, and now says that the mayor just hasn't had the guts to do his job. Uh, while community activists complain uh, that the city is being treated like a third world country in being essentially forced into uh, an extreme form of structural adjustment. And Tea Party activists locally allege that a corrupted state government will just try to borrow Atlantic City into recovery. So according to Christie, um, I'm not going to take responsibility for what happens in Atlantic City if I don't have the authority to fix the problem. I will not change my view on this. The state is, is not providing any money. It's over. The credit card has been cut up and cancelled. They have to be responsible. So this is the rationale uh, for um, the takeover. And so I'll end on this point uh, on the question of Caesarism and the city. This is the pattern of uh, casinos in Atlantic City. Um, casinos have been playing their own version of the Monopoly game since the late 1970s. They had a long winning streak, but much of it ex at the expense of the city itself. Having encountered harder times, those casinos that remain are carving up a post-growth market and feeding off uh, what is left, having benefited from $50 billion of public uh, investment. Caesars Casino itself was the second casino that moved into Atlantic City uh, in 1979 in a converted Howard Johnson's hotel. There are 3,400 slot machines there, all encased in an ancient Roman theme. Uh, Caesars itself entered bankruptcy in 2005. Caesars' Roman theme is apt, I think, because essentially uh, the governance of financially challenged US cities is being discussed in these very terms at the present time. Um, a recent paper, a 100-page law review paper by Clayton Gillette, a NU, NYU law professor, uh, starts off talking about the fiscal crises of American cities by invoking Roman, ancient Roman uh, forms of governance. Uh, it's, it starts off discussing the fact that in ancient Rome, dictatorial powers were often used to arrest, uh, to coin money, to preside over assemblies in, in local governments, for example. He confesses that these dictatorial powers of the Caesars were not used as a response to fiscal problems, but typically as responses to war, insurrection and unrest. However, he argues that this very apparatus should now be applied to American cities uh, on facing financial collapse like Atlantic City. Gillette argues that an appointed, indeed dictatorial, takeover board will be better positioned to resolve the underlying issues of fiscal instability than better, in fact, than more democratic alternatives. 
So what we have here are rationalizations of the suspension of democracy, complete takeover by emergency managers, the standing down of mayors and elected officials as rationalized according to, bizarrely, a Caesarist model of governance. And I'll end on this slide, which is um, from the Manhattan Institute's uh, Stephen Ide. I don't think he always looks quite as shifty as that, but uh, it's appropriate uh, in the circumstances. Uh, he argues that the most serious threats to city budgets at the present time, excessive debt, political dysfunction, soft tax bases, are not going away anytime soon. To prevent more Detroit's state government should rein in local officials' ability to make bad financial decisions. If we want stronger cities, we should support more state-imposed constraints upon them. Tough decisions will be necessary to forestall local insolvency. Distance from local political pressures, state governments, governments are more likely than local governments to make such decisions. States need to step in, seize alike, earlier and more vigorously. And so we've got here a kind of post-democratic, crisis-driven model of financialized governance that reflects the particular conjunctural situation of the United States, uses the particular legal apparatus and political arguments of the United States, producing a particularized outcome, which I think is nevertheless connected to the way in which hegemonies are perpetually remade. This is not a stable condition. It's a rolling series of transformations and crises for which there are continuous responses. We never know how the story will end, but I think following these kinds of stories will help us understand how hegemonic projects themselves are transformed through crisis and transformation. The notion uh, that Detroit will be made, remade uh, by the, um, uh, the, the creative class moving in with their kind of hipster projects uh, is um, yeah, essentially a racist account of, of urban transformation. It suggests that the solutions to Detroit are going to be carried uh, into the city. They're not going to be found amongst the local residents. Uh, you look at all of the New York Times profiles of the Detroit Renaissance and so on, they're nearly all images of young white men uh, running their new companies in some uh, downtown kind of bunker in Detroit. Uh, the, re the, the majority of the city gets little benefit from those interventions. It's a narrative that I think reflects the kind of intersection of that kind of banal creativity script with financialized restructuring for the African-American working class population of Detroit. Uh, in a sense, all of these forces are interacting in Detroit. Uh, the reason I put Atlantic City outside of that space in the Venn diagram is I don't think there's a, much of a chance for the, the startup culture argument in, in, in Atlantic City and not much of a chance for a creative makeover. They've tried a little bit. Uh, but Detroit is a much more uh, uh, productive potentially site for those sorts of experiments and I think it's the place where we see the most intensive forms of late neoliberal experimentation in the US urban landscape. If you actually look at uh, the cities that are experiencing, there's not much growth to go around in many US cities at the moment. Um, a lot of them are not existing in conditions of growth, they're in, their economies are relatively flat, uh, and increasingly the challenges of urban governance are arrayed around these questions of how you manage long-term deficits. Cities can't run a deficit legally in the US, so they have to re resort to creative accounting stealing from the pension funds and so on. And so we see each of these as becomes a new line of attack in the kind of rolling uh, remaking of the US city. So when the, in the Detroit uh, bankruptcy settlement, uh, when it was ruled by the federal bankruptcy judge that pensions were impairable in a uh, bankruptcy settlement, that established a pattern to go after municipal pension funds in other US cities. That was the precedent uh, that the strategists on the right were hoping would come out of the Detroit settlement. It was a big haircut for others uh, in that settlement, but they established a precedent that you could actually now raid the pension funds to bail out cities. And so this 
in a sense, the attack on public sector workers and public sector unions is absolutely a critical one, I think, for the US city at the moment, because they are the defenders of the pension funds and so on, which are now regarded as this resource for refloating uh, the US city. So I think it's sort of this sort of array of um, financial considerations and actors, uh, which is the fate of cities is increasingly in their hands as opposed to the hands of localised growth elites organising a growth project. I mean, that's still going on, but I think it's less and less relevant to the actual economic future of cities. The economic future of these cities is being governed by these largely external financial forces managed through credit rating agencies, the way in which the bond market operates and so on. Uh, Atlantic City lost access to the bond market altogether in 2015. That's what pushed it into the state takeover moment that they're considering now. Um, so I think these have not necessarily been, many of us could do urban political economy without paying much attention to the kind of work you were doing on finance all that, those years. I don't think that's possible anymore. I think financialization and the act, financial actors are absolutely key players in urban political economy now and have to be considered alongside the growth elites and other, others that we've normally paid attention to. The, the racial component of this whole uh, conjuncture and strategy is absolutely key. If I wasn't flying so fast at the end, I would have spent more time on this issue. It's certainly in the paper. Um, in the state of Michigan, um, uh, if you look at the population that are under emergency managers, where essentially elected democracy have been, has been suspended, 2% of the white population of Michigan are under an uh, uh, emergency manager, 50% of the African American population. Half. So this is a it's entirely predicated on the earlier kind of failure of dif different models of urbanisation and the, and the fact that you've got African American populations uh, stranded in downtowns that are largely devoid of jobs and so on. Um, that is the basis on which these strategies are being projected. Uh, that's why the language of um, a dictatorship and plantations and so on is being used by the African-American councillors in Atlantic City. Um, it's clearly a strategy, it's invariably uh, a white elites in state capitals taking over uh, majority black cities is the pattern of emergency management, broadly speaking, across the US. But again, we have to take account of each of those conjunctures in that New Jersey manages its strategy different to Michigan. Michigan has got the toughest emergency manager rules in the United States. They go in, take over, and all the stories about Detroit and Flint and so on we've heard are the consequence of that. Uh, New Jersey's is a more paternalistic model uh, where they try to go into a kind of asymmetrical partnership with their cities. They're doing the same, they've done the same kind of thing in Camden. So again, when we're working down the levels of abstraction, we don't find exactly the same formulations in each place. But I would argue that these are, there are family rem resemblances between them that we should pay attention to. And you're quite right to underline uh, the important racial component of this, which I think we have to take account of in any study of uh, US urban transformation at the moment. That's a beast of a question to answer, but uh, uh, in terms of the actual data, but I've found the people who've got the data. Uh, I've seen the general trend about intergovernmental transfers. It's exactly the one you describe. Uh, this has been rolled back essentially since Nixon, the Nixon era, and, and, but it's been a, basically an intergenerational process of rolling back uh, Keynesian fiscal transfers and intergovernmental transfers. That wasn't something that happened abruptly either under Nixon or under Reagan, but it's been a long run, continual process. Uh, and the really striking thing, I've been, I've been reading this stuff about Atlantic City heavily now for about six months. Um, the one actor that is never, ever mentioned is Washington, D.C. Like, there's never an invocation of the, uh, the federal scale. Obama doesn't speak on it, Obama doesn't answer to it. It's just off the agenda completely. And that is a form of hegemonic uh, transformation, I would argue, that now the only place to look for these kinds of solutions is local. When there's no answers locally, state takeovers are okay. 
Uh, and it's interesting, it's Republican governors in the class of 2010 in Michigan, New Jersey, elsewhere that are adopting these kind of authoritarian interventionist strategies which have been rationalized on the hoof by the Manhattan Institute, by conservative lawyers in the Federalist Society and so on. But they hadn't figured out this plan. They, didn't, they literally didn't have a template. They're making this stuff up as they go along. And so this is literally crisis management where they don't know how the script will play out. Uh, but the really, really striking thing, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned this, is you know, what's absent from the story, which is any conception of a wider federal role. Uh, even in Detroit, where the moment that there, were, there was any talk of Obama money going into Detroit, you hit the scream you hear now is bailout. The, the lib, neoliberal translation of an intergovernmental transfer is a bailout. Uh, and so every one of those is negatively tagged um, as soon as it is proposed. And it's very, very hard to justify a bailout politically. And so there's an attack which is kind of instinctive on any form of intergovernmental transfer. And it reflects, I think, how far we've moved from a kind of federal settlement for the cities.